Danto, thank you so much for joining us here on the Build Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you for inviting. Very happy to participate on the podcast from the folks that created the term PNG. So we're going to be talking about a term or a, a concept that relates to product-led growth. Um, and a lot of PLG people are talking about it. Um, and that is community. Um, now, I think before we get into the weeds of community and how to do it and how to get results from it, I think we need to start at the highest level, which is recognizing that community is definitely a major buzzword right now. Uh, and I think anytime there's a new buzzword that starts to trend, people tend to have two questions. What exactly does this mean? Uh, and why is everybody talking about it? So, so let's start there, um, you know, in, in, in terms of setting the stage on community. What do you think? Uh, how do you define it? Why do you think this is, uh, you know, trending right now? First of all, something that to me is important is I've been reading a lot about like community-led growth um, as a new term and a new way to think about uh, um, growth for bottoms-up startups. And that I think is wrong. It's just a buzzword. I'm a big believer in product-led growth. And when you ask me about community, to me, it's a key component that should exist from a marketing perspective. What is community? It's basically about creating or engaging with a set of folks that really love your product or that need help and are looking to help others. There's multiple ways, and we'll talk about the multiple ways where you can engage, but the idea is to get a lot of people that are engaged with you, that are using the platform, that are helping others, and are looking to connect with others that are similar to them. Why I think it's important right now is in these times of bear markets that exist right now, everyone is looking for efforts that bring revenue or leads with a low customer acquisition cost. Community, if you think about it, is a very low CAC effort. Because the idea is you start building the community, you invest some money to build it, but then the people who are there in the community will start inviting others and bringing others in the community. So it's a key viral loop that will actually be pretty cheap on that sense. It's hard to make it work well, but it's only resources mostly that you'll invest. Um, and I think it's a good marketing tactic and technique as well as a product tactic uh, that we can do in these times. So, so I'm hearing from that that it's, uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, recognizing that there's all these people out there that have the problem that you solve. They might already be connecting with one another and talking about that problem, um, or they might have already found your product and be passionate about it, and they're doing things with it, and they're starting to you know, maybe add to the platform, right? They're creating templates, or maybe they're a developer, and they're building something on it, and they're starting to you know, invest in your product. And so how do we kind of find those people and, and, and sort of uh, support them and, and, and also kind of further feed them? So that's the, the, the sort of concept at the high level. And then the, yeah. the how um, sort of it becomes a, a key component of marketing and your marketing strategy that you mentioned. And then there are certainly, again, you know, because this is all in the context of PLG, there are certainly then um, elements within product itself, you know, creating referral loops and, and other things that can kind of um, uh, take advantage and tap into this community that you're, you're going and building. Does that sort of sum it up? Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay. Awesome. So with that stage set, um, I think the next obvious question that, that I hear from folks, and certainly it occurs to me, is um, how do you create a, uh, or sorry, let me, let me start that back. Um, okay. So with that stage set, I think the next question that, uh, that occurs to me, and I certainly hear from other folks, is that if I want to prioritize a community strategy, should I go and create my own community from scratch, or should I tap into an existing community? So what are your thoughts on that? This is something that to me is interesting because everybody is talking about communities and everybody is talking about, no, we need to always create our own community. And I think creating your own community is so hard that I would say most companies should not do it. When you think about creating a community, it's looking to have a lot of people who want to engage with your product. And of course, they need to get something out of it. That something can be they increase their brand, they become more known, or they have a new space as a thought leader in a community or in a platform that you're helping. So if you think about it that way, what that means is that typically it makes sense to create a community if your product is open source, if you're like a developer tool, or if you have like a very big free offering. Why? Because if the product is open source, a lot of people want to be known for that product. But if it has a very big free offering, it's really good to create your own brand about, yeah, I'm one of the most recognized people in this community. I'm very good at this. And creating that community will then be easier because a lot of folks will try to be part and be leaders in that community. If your product is mostly closed source, and you have like a small free plan or a free trial, and then you have other users who can use the platform through self-service or through enterprise sales, in those cases, 
the product itself might not be as known to, to, to the sense that people want to create a community out of that, or they can create a big brand where anybody will be able to use it. Maybe a company like Stripe can do it because they are already huge. They're so well known and it looks well on somebody like, no, I'm an expert on Stripe. But for most other startups that are starting, they are smaller. It's going to be very hard to get a lot of adepts, to get a lot of people who want to be leaders in that community because they won't be able to get a lot out of it. Yeah, to me, the, the parallel that's occurring to me is actually uh, kind of around category creation uh, because everybody wants to create their own category and define the category. But a lot of times you should just look at the market and say, all right, is there already a category here? And can we just latch on to that and be the, the new improved version of it? Um, because if you're trying to create a category out of every product, it's just, you know, there's not that many categories in the world. There's a there's a handful, right? And then there's a bunch of sub things underneath that. And so I'm kind of hearing something similar here is that you could have a default, you know, going in assumption of like, of course, we should create our own community. We're, we're so special and we have such a cool product that and we're so innovative that, you know, we, we got to define this thing from scratch. But you're saying that there's only really a, a select number of situations in which that makes sense. And more often, it'll make sense to identify the existing community and tap into that and figure out how to differentiate within that versus, you know, starting from scratch and kind of reinventing the wheel. Exactly. And I think it's very similar to, as you're saying, to category creation. Most startups shouldn't create a category. And when they think about it, like for a product to be real and find product market fit, there has to be some competition. Because if there's no competition, there's probably no market for it. So 100% agree. And I think that for those startups, it's definitely easier to tap into an existing community. Creating a community is also very hard. It takes a lot of time to start growing a mass of thousands of users who care about their product so that then you can distribute content or distribute things with them and they will share it with friends. However, when you join an existing community, maybe it's a community that already has hundreds of people or thousands of people. And we'll talk about like some of the difference uh, on that. But if you if you look at those, that means that you already have a big market that you can distribute some content in. So it's also lower effort in the beginning to get a lot more upside on the eyeballs that are going to be seeing um, whatever you talk about or whatever you share. Okay, so let's unpack both of these scenarios a little bit further. So um, even though it's, again, you know, kind of more of the, uh, you know, the rarer example of when you should create your own community, but if, if you are an open source company or maybe you're a massive mass market free plan offering type of thing, and it does make sense for you, um, how do you identify the potential members to target um, if you're building from scratch? I think if you have an open source product or something that is very free, like the focus will be something around that product, of course. And then about finding the people, there's two ways of how we think about creating a community. You either create a community that is mostly physical in person, or you create a community that is mostly online. So that is number one decision that you have to make. Once you make the decision, and of course you can eventually have both, then you'll go different routes. If you go the physical route, what I would think about are, okay, what are the, I, I want to create a global community, but for that, I start one region or one local place at a time, because it's very hard to start from a global one. So what I would do is, let's say, for example, this is a great example, this is something that Docker um, has done. What Docker did was they looked into the US and Europe, and they started looking into small regions where they already saw a lot of people were tweeting about Docker or a lot of people were talking about Docker on Slack communities or somewhere. And they looked for the people that were the most vocal that talked about the most. And the rich, they reached out and they offered them to create a local community for them in that region for Docker. What they would get is they would basically be promoted as one of the local regions, uh, the local experts of Docker. They would get uh, free food and free alcohol, basically, for the event. They will get free swag and um, they will send speakers that are from Docker so that they have really good content. And the only thing that they ask is that this person, who is already sort of known somehow in that local community, that they bring people to the event and start bringing others. And then eventually you offer them to start connecting with other local region leaders. So they all meet together and you get to learn from other ones as well. And you start going that once by once by once. So the crazy part is that to create this global community, maybe we, you started with these local ones. that are doing small meetups of 50, 100 people that keep on changing. And as you start growing some of them, then it also becomes easier to now create an online community. 
because now you have a lot of folks who are really interested about Docker. You can promote it in this example on some of the Docker groups and you start getting some of them. On the online route, I think it is a bit harder, but what I would do in the beginning is if I'm working on an open source product, I will look for people ideally that are already well known in that community and offer them something in exchange of being part of your community in the beginning. And maybe you start with a Discord or online or a Slack. And if you can find two, three, or four of these experts that know a lot about this technology, and you ask them, like, look, like maybe you, like, you pay them money to stay there for a month and answer questions to people that come or something like that, that's a great perk to start getting people to come and learn from the biggest experts um, on, on, on this area. And then eventually you start gathering others by kickstarting it with something like that. But I do think that in the beginning, when you're starting a community online, you have to have some experts or some people that have already talked to others um, in that community. Okay, so if you're going to be building your own community from scratch, um, in both of those scenarios, uh, it sounds like you're looking for signal. Um, you're looking for signal, if it's the in-person physical version of it, you're looking for signal from a region. What's the region? What's the city? What's the part of that town, you know, where people are talking about our thing? Um, and, and you kind of, you know, think globally, act locally, right? The, the famous old saying, and you kind of go region by region. But again, you're looking for signal, like where is there already organic uh, folks getting together that are passionate about this thing? Uh, on the online side of things, you're still looking for signal, but instead of it being more localized to a particular, you know, geography, it's more about who is the expert, who is spiking above and who is who is already has a following here? Who are people already listening to? And how do we sort of get them, you know, to be the the initial champions of our community? But in both cases, you're looking for not a mass of a thousands, thousands of people out of the gates. You're looking for signal of where do you start and how do you get the ball rolling? Exactly correct. You won't be able to start with a big, big ball, let's say, of people in the beginning. I think it is always important to think global and act local, as, as you said. Okay, so other scenario, um, which is, again, as you had said, going to be the more common scenario for most companies, which is to tap into an existing community. So if you are going down that path and you're tapping into to something that's already out there, how do you identify which communities to target? And then once you've identified that potential superset of communities, how do you prioritize that list? And then do you ultimately go after one, the best one? Do you go after multiple? How do you figure out this kind of existing community thing? So I talk about this existing, like tapping into an existing community with two examples, one of OutZero, where I used to work, and one from Bercel, um, a company that I currently advise. But the idea here is, okay, if you're going to tap into an existing community, you should think about which communities you're going to pick as bets. So the idea is some of them will work, some of them will not work if I try to tap into an existing community. So how I try to think about these bets is I always try to go after two communities, ideally. One of the two has to be something that is already established. So it's a, an established community that is big, that maybe it's hard for you in the beginning to get in, but once you're in, it's going to be very uh, useful because it's like the most known community, one of the most known communities of, of, of this point. The other community that I would pick is what I would call an up-and-comer. So it's a community that is maybe just starting, but you bet because it's based on a technology, on a framework, on a specific problem that is going to grow. And on that one, it's much easier to actually become part and a thought leader of that community uh, in the beginning. And then once you become one in the beginning, when there's very few people, once they grow, it's a good bet. So I always try to think about when I pick the niche of one that is up and coming, that is small and I'm betting on, one that is established, it's going to be harder, but I go into that community. Now, once you, and I'll give you the example of Outsido. For Outsido, remember this was eight years ago, but the community that in our case we picked as established was jQuery because everybody was writing jQuery at that, at that point. And the up and coming community was AngularJS. AngularJS was like a front end framework. It was useful for authentication. It was on version like 0 0.4. So we thought that it was going to be huge because it was from Google. So we started to be part of that community um, in the beginning. Once you have these two ideas, then what you need is somebody to go and be part and tap into these communities. For that, what you typically need is an X relations role, as I, will, as I would call it. 
What is that? If you're a developer tool, it will be developer relations, developer evangelist, or developer advocate. It's these people who are of the same user type that the user. So if you're focusing on developers, they're a developer, and their job is to work with the community, give talks, create content, and just have empathy and engage. It started with developers, but I've seen this now in other companies as well, like Amplitude, very known PLG product. They had John Cutler as the product evangelist. Very similar, but focused on other persona on products. So, and, and, I, and I'm starting to see this on HR and others. I'm personally a big believer of this role. And this role will basically now tap into these existing communities. What do they need to do? They need to become a thought leader. And to become a thought leader, they need to build like influence with others. So for example, in the Outzero case, when we decided that we were going to go after AngularJS, what we decided was that we were going to go to every AngularJS conference in the world. There were 10 conferences in the world. We decided to go to all of them with our developer evangelist, evangelism team. Why did we decide to go to all of the conferences in the world? Not for the attendees, not because of the people who were going to listen us there, but because of the speakers. Because when you go to the conferences and you go to 10 around the world, it's the same speakers. It's the creators of the frameworks, it's the creators of other libraries, and you go to a speaker dinner, you go drinking with them, you go eating with them, you build relationships. And then when you build content on your blog, for example, you build relationship with these influencers, and then these influencers start sharing your content. For example, in our case, in AngularJS, we have like the creator of AngularJS, the manager of the project, the manager of Angular Router, which was another known project, start sharing some of our content for the, from the Outzero blog that was generic about authentication, not specific about Outzero, but it was in our page. And because all of the influencers in AngularJS community started to talk about us, then we became a thought leader. Everybody came to ask questions to us about authentication in general. And they started to come to our blog automatically from, from doing that. So from that point, once AngularJS community grew, we were already known. So it helped us a lot. And then we started to do that on other, other technologies in our end. It was mostly front-end, like React and Next.js at the same time. And it doesn't have to be only a front-end technology. Another great example, I think, is Bercel, um, one of the companies that I help with. Um, and what they do is like deployment uh, on the cloud on Edge. And for them, of course, one of their ideas was like, okay, open source frameworks for front-end as well. That's why they hired Rich Harris, who is the owner and works on Spence. But besides that, another community that was interesting to them is performance obsessed front-enders. It's a small community. There are not as many of them yet, but we believe that it's gonna be a big deal in the future on the front-end performance. And if we become a thought leader there, in the future, we're gonna be big, similar to the Outsido case, but instead of making it through a framework like AngularJS, it's through a concept of this performance obsessed. And what that means is that with this approach, you can start tapping into some of these communities one at a time with focus by building these relationships first with the influencers, by having them share your content and by having people come to your content. And with that, you're tapping into the people that follow these influencers and the people that follow um, this community already. So like many other things, um, I, I think what I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot from, from uh, all the good stuff that you just said, but you know, at the highest level, um, I, again, anytime somebody approaches a new thing, there can be this misconception that there is a perfect strategy that you can find. Um, and if you just research hard enough uh, and long enough, you can find that silver bullet. Um, and what you're saying is, um, you know, back to where you started with it is uh, you need to place multiple bets because you can't actually predict what's going to work out. And then those bets that you place, uh, there needs to be some diversity in them, right? You know, one big established thing, one more up and coming thing. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of like, you know, an A-B test, right? You're kind of saying which of these seems to resonate better, which tactics work from one to the other. Uh, and then you, you know, run it like an experiment, like you would with anything else. Um, and so I think that's really clarifying to me is that uh, you're not trying to find the perfect thing and sort of a priori predict uh, perfect success out of the gates. It's more so what are the highest probability places, both big as well as up and coming? Let's cover all of those. Um, let's experiment rapidly and let's see what happens. I also really like the idea of reframing what success looks like. And, and really, it kind of comes down to thinking it, think about it from first principles, which is if you're just thinking about it like from a pattern, a pattern matching standpoint, you might say, well, events are all about attendees and getting leads. 
Uh, but your point was really, really interesting. If you're building community, uh, the goal is to get influence. The way you get influence is by being associated with the other influencers or thought leaders in that space. So it's more about the speakers uh, than it is about the attendees. And so these concepts make a lot of sense. You know, you, you got to make multiple bets. And then when you make multiple bets, you have to look at success through the right lens uh, to make sure that you're not just focused on a vanity metric, um, but, you know, really the thing that actually is going to move the needle in this whole community effort. 100%. And that's the, the concept of bets is something I think is important for whatever you do on PLG. I'm, I'm an engineer turned marketer, so big fan of experiments and thinking on everything as, as a bet. So once you've gone through this exercise of either identifying the community you want to build from scratch or identifying the communities that exist that you want to tap into, I think the next question is, okay, great. Well, how do you engage them? Uh, and you've already referred to a couple of channels and you've referred to a couple of, you know, in-person strategies as well. But if we zoom back out again, like myself and I'm sure anybody else that follows, you know, kind of this stuff, they hear things like Slack and Discord and Twitter thrown around as, as popular channels and then certainly any of us that spend time on Product Hunt uh, have seen a, a bunch of startups that are, you know, trying to launch dedicated community platforms as well. So, you know, what do you think about this? What are the channels that make sense? What is the strategy that makes the most sense to actually engage, you know, this community that you're tapping into? So to start with, I'm personally a big believer on doing research with the user. So to pick which is the right technology, something that I do is if I'm targeting developers, I would interview developers to ask, do you belong to any community? How do you engage with them? Do you go offline? Is it online? Where is it and how? So I think it's a lot of the research will tell you on, on the tools and how to think about it. Some of the things that I personally have used in the past is, I think for developers, Twitter is a must. Like you have to be on the conversation on Twitter. And if you are there and you can be part of the conversation and start answering, that means you're tapping into an existing community. But a lot of times to be on Twitter, you need to first meet them in on person somehow. That's why I, I was talking about before of you go to a conference, you meet with the speakers, you go drinking and eating with them. Then they know of you. Now you can engage on Twitter and people see what you engage on Twitter, not the other one. But I think the Twitter engagement is, is one that is really important. Discord, I think is fast, is fantastic for online communities. I personally prefer it to Slack. But what I've seen is that a lot of like crypto startups, um, and gaming startups have been using Discord, some new of developer ones, but a lot of the others are still using Slack because it's more regular tool. Like I've seen that if you target marketers, um, something like Slack might make more sense. And then for doing some of the local meetups and getting some of these local champions, um, how to engage with them is all about how you add them value. Like if you think about these champ community champions that I mentioned on creating your own community, um, if you think like the two biggest ones that exist are Microsoft with the MVP and Google with Google Developer Experts or the GDE. And those two are valuable because you have a checkbox of like Microsoft says I'm awesome or Google says I'm awesome. When we did that at Out Zero, people don't care if Out Zero says you're awesome. So we needed to find like a different niche. So it's around finding what is the exact one. And for us, what we ended up finding out was we looked for people who have spoken at local meetups but had never spoken at a big conference. And what we offered them was, if you talk about Outzero and you engage uh, and you engage with the community about Outzero, we'll give you a course on how to become a better speaker. We'll pay you the flight and we'll pay you the hotel to go speak at the conference. So the, our niche was people who are great speakers that didn't have the resources or the means to go to conferences where we taught them how to give better talks. We gave them money to go to conferences and in exchange, we asked them to engage with people in the community. So that was a, like a really good way for us to engage on understanding what is the niche that you're tackling? What are the needs from these people and how can it be like a win-win relationship from, from the two of us? Okay, so we just talked a lot about those channels and some of these you know, ways to be successful from a, a strategy approach um, you know, to the engagement piece. But uh, w one thing I didn't hear you say much about was these dedicated platforms. So what's your, your thesis on that? Is this something that every company that's prioritizing community should have? Or because of we're, we're, we're talking about going to where they're actually currently hanging out, that creating your own community platform uh, is, is maybe less valuable? What, what's your take on that? So... I've seen different type of community platforms. Um, uh, what, what, the ones that I like, for example, in the past, I've seen uh, 
discourse, which is the one that uh, from Stack Overflow, or like questions and answers, which I really like as a community, but it's not as engaging because it's not live, for example. And I've tried a lot of the other community tools that exist out there, and just and those tools a lot of times are less known by the user than a Discord or a Slack or a Twitter, which they use on their day to day. So personally, even though I've seen a lot of those community platforms, I don't like them that much because it means moving the user to a new thing that they are not used to. So it's not just getting them to join the community, but also to learn about another tool or another platform that they have not used um, in the past, which I think actually makes it harder. There's other community tools like Ad Advocate Hub and similar tools that allow you to find champions in your customers or similar which I've also not seen be very successful with any of the companies that I've used. In general, a more human manual approach rather than this automatic through a tool has been better. But if there's so many of them, it's probably that I, I'm wrong and they are gonna succeed and I just don't know how to use them. No, but, but it is really uh, clarifying because again, anytime something new comes onto the scene, a lot of times people can be looking for that shortcut. And a lot of times the shortcut in the startup world is, okay, well, what's the tool I buy that does that thing? And, you know, the magic button I press that uh, that just, you know, delivers the results. Um, and uh, if, if you're looking to do a big strategic initiative, like, so let's say you're looking to, you know, uh, embrace PLG for the first time, you know, it's not a product you're going to buy that's going to help you with that transition. Or if you're looking to really do community and do community the right way and build a true, large, authentic community that's like added a bunch of business value, it's not going to be through buying like the exact right product to make that magically happen. It's through the actual real human effort uh, of being a human and, and being a community member and, and being a community leader, like you said. So, so it's helpful. Exactly. So uh, what I'm hearing from, you know, channels, uh, maybe starting at the most tactical level is that you need to be aware of your audiences or, you know, in this case, your community's preferred channels. Um, because if you're trying to engage with them someplace that they're not, uh, it's going to be a lonely party. <laughs> and so if uh, if you're a developer product, you got to be on Twitter uh, and, and we can kind of follow the logic from there. So be aware of uh, of your community preferences and where they actually hang out and go hang out there. Uh, don't try to create something new. And then the second piece is um, you have to have a real relationship, uh, whether that's you've met uh, in person, IRL, you know, offline, and then now you're connecting on Twitter uh, or whatever it may be, but you know, you, you can't just sort of expect to show up in a, in a community and, and all of a sudden get all the retweets, right? You have to build some, uh, some credibility, some social proof and a real relationship. Um, and then the last piece is now that you have a relationship, um, you need to not be selfish. <laughs> this isn't just about like, okay, great. When are you going to send me my leads? When are you going to do X and Y and Z for me? Uh, it's instead about how can I help you? What's important to you? And there's a million and one examples that you could you could point to, but I liked yours a lot of you know giving helping people by giving them a platform um, and giving putting them the spotlight on them uh, and elevating them and also giving them the enablement so that they you know deliver and and have a really great talk when they're on stage. Uh, and so having that you know again empathy of thinking about what's important to this person, how can I add value to them now that I have a real relationship, now that I'm engaging where they are all of that stuff makes it feel authentic and not just this like, you know, kind of commercial transaction that, you know, you, you very quickly see through, right? 100%. I need to find somebody like you to come work with me. You're much better at explaining my, my concepts <laughs> than myself. I need definitely somebody like you in my life. <laughs> this, is, this is a good team effort. We're, we're iterating <laughs> together and, and coming up with the truth for, for community. So this is great. Um, okay, so, so uh, getting uh, even more practical, Let's talk about who, right, uh, which, which ultimately comes down to team. And so if you want to pursue this, um, what does the community team look like and who owns this effort inside a PLG company? So on who owns the effort, that's, I would say, a very big question because it depends. I've seen it in some companies it lives in marketing. In some other companies, it actually lives in like a product team or something similar because they also want to engage with the product. I think it has trade-offs. How I think about it is if your focus is more on like our brand awareness, I think it has to be on marketing. But a lot of times it's more about the focus on getting people to help each other, get ideas on how to improve the product and stuff like that. In those cases, I think it might make sense for it to be in product. How the team looks like, I think 
the number one key role that I still don't see in a lot of startups is this X relations role, this developer relations or product relations or HR relations or whatever it is. It's this role of, it's a person of the same type of user of your PLG product. So if you send to developers, it's developer relations. And the idea is they are really good at what they do. So they are, they are a really good developer. They are really good product manager or a really good HR business partner. But they also love this concept of helping others, teaching to others, engaging with others, creating content and engaging with the community, which is an additional on top. That to me is the core soul of this community. Because if you want to be known in the community, you need to build respect and authority. And it's hard to build respect and authority with somebody who doesn't speak the same language as your user. I've seen a lot of companies that only have a community manager as part of the community team. I think that's very wrong because a community manager might be an expert in creating communities, but they are not an expert at engaging with your user and with creating respect, authority uh, with them and teaching them things. So I think it's very important that uh, it's not only a community manager, but I do think that a community manager helps a lot on the team. Something that happens a lot is that it's developer relations or product relations team are very good with empathy, connecting with others and creating content, but they suck at project management, setting things as experiments, thinking about what things are going to drive more revenue or more leads or more whatever. So I see the community manager as a great partner for this X relations person where they will help with how to set this up as an experiment, how to pick together uh, bets of communities, as we talked about, how to frame it, how to check if it worked, how to check if it didn't, um, and similar to that. And then finally, I do think you need somebody, if you're tapping into existing communities, content becomes very important because you need people to start sharing your content on Twitter, on Discord, or whatever. That content can be written by this developer relations or X relations person, or it could be written by um, a content writer. I've seen two things work depending on the industry. I think like, for example, if the content is very technical, if it goes to developer, you should also have engineers that write. Um, and that could be developer relations or technical writers. But maybe if you're talking to product managers, you can hire a journalist who will be good at interviewing your uh, internal product managers and then write about product management. But I think having a content person as part of the team, if you're tapping into existing communities, also becomes um, extremely important. So now that we've talked about who um, and the team that's going to be owning community, and it's definitely a cross-functional thing. It's not one person that, that owns it and is the hero of it. Um, what is this team looking for uh, in terms of how do you know what success looks like? So what's the ultimate business value of community? And what are the KPIs you should track in order to know if you're getting that business value and if you're being successful with this effort? That's a great question. And as a caveat before answering, the one thing I will say is that it's very hard to have a direct attribution of, to a, from a community to revenue or something similar. Um, just because a lot of the interactions happen online uh, on places that you don't control or offline on places that you don't even know about. But besides the disclaimer, the first thing that I would say is the number one thing that matters about the community is signups to your platform. Like you're building a community so more people know of your product and more people sign up either to the free trial or to the free account. So starting to get more signups, I think, is number one as a core metric that should increase, of course, not fully attributable to community, but something that I think is important to look about. The other one is around how many engagements are you having on some of these platforms? A lot of people count how many people they have in the community. Like I have 30,000 members on Slack or 20,000 members in Discord. And in reality, the only thing that matters about the community is, the, is if the community is live. So the one thing I would check is how many engagements do you have in the community? Meaning how many people are interacting and chatting on Slack on a daily basis or on a weekly basis? How many of them are interacting on Discord and on some of the other platforms? How many of, you, of them are interacting with you on Twitter? So those type of engagements, I think, are a lot more important than the number that you have um, as a vanity metric. Another one that I use... And it's more, it's, it's harder, but it's one that I use a lot is when, I, when we pick a community that we want to tap into, I'm a big believer in finding who are the influencers of that community. And I think a great KPI is wh how many of them have shared contents about us on Twitter or on Discord or on LinkedIn or whatever their main platform is. 
And that, even though it won't bring you signups exactly or something correlated to the business, it will tell you about how your efforts to tap into an existing community are working. Because if I went to 10 events and zero of the most known influencers have tweeted or talked about my content, then I'm doing something wrong. So that to me is like a vibe check on, okay, is this working? Going to the conferences, going to the events, how, what's going on? And then the last one that I'll say is for a lot of these or like uh, on, on the idea of tapping into existing community or creating a community, it all lives around content. The difference is that the content, maybe they don't find it through Google, but they actually find it through a tweet, a LinkedIn or a message or something like that. So the other way that I'm a big believer is looking at um, first touch attribution from content, meaning how many people who found your website for the first time eh, through that blog eventually converted into a sign up. Because that will tell you like if people are sharing your article in the community or on Twitter or in Discord or whatever, that will be a first touch for a lot of users and drive signups. And that I think is the closest that you can get um, to something that really affects the, the bottom line. Those are the main ones that I, that I usually use for, for thinking about the community. That's perfect. And, and I definitely think it, it helps to, uh, to clarify some of those true business metrics and, and what success actually looks like and to avoid the temptation of vanity metrics because it's really easy to, to focus on those uh, and to you know, lull yourself to, to sleep. <laughs> well, uh, meanwhile, uh, the business value might uh, you know, be absent or the engagement might be absent. So, so super clarifying there. And, and look, I think that uh, that's a really good place to leave it. Uh, we've covered all the bases here on community. I think, you know, a lot of the stuff at the beginning of the conversation for me, certainly, I think for a lot of our listeners serve to kind of demystify this idea of this buzzword that, that everybody hears about out there and how to actually go start the experimentation process uh, and, and start this effort at your company. So Ganto, thank you so much for uh, walking us through your, your thoughts here. This has been great. Thank you very much for inviting. This was fantastic.